Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic. We have Dan Mullins coming back to do part two of his talk. I was so impressed with Coach Mullins. Coach, how you doing today? Are you ready to get going, man? Are you pumped up? Always. I've already had my caffeine, so we're pretty good. Let's get it, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, again, hey, I thank you for uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, I, I had a great conversation. I thought I left I left part one when we were talking on Monday. Um, I think we did a great job of, of framing the the content, framing the topic, and, and getting started. Um, and I definitely want to make sure I share kind of the rest of the program, the rest of what we do, um, because it really it really brings it full circle um, and kind of makes it un makes uh, helps coaches understand you know what we do, why we do it, um, and some of those questions that we think about uh, at different times of the year. Because you know it's important that we're not training the same way year round. Um, if, if we did train the same way year round, you know, we would get really good at what we do, um, but it's not it's not optimal for athletes. And I think that's um, a, a lot of coaches see that um, a lot. Of, I think it's a fairly intuitive uh, topic. Um, it's fairly, you know, it, it makes sense that once you hit the end season, we got to dial back the training just a little bit when it comes to how much we're training. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of different things, a lot of different pieces and moving parts that go into it that. If you're not um, if if you're not highly in tune to the profession, um, it's very easy to to overlook some of that some of the minute details. So um, I think it's important that we we came back on and we we kept talking because I know there's some of the stuff that we're going to talk about here in part two. Uh, it, it are are big boxes that coaches are trying to check. So um, we'll we'll kind of jump back in. Um, I'll share my screen here. Um, All right, Coach, can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so one of the big topics that a lot of people are talking about right now is how to make athletes more explosive. Um, more specifically, we're going to talk about how to make them faster. Uh, here's, here's a little bit. But we're going to talk about how to make them more explosive. Um, so one of the ways that we use is what's called the French contrast method. Um, there's all it's it's kind of a, a subtopic under a, a larger umbrella of what's called PAP or post activation potentiation. It's just a fancy way of saying we use something heavy to unlock so a heavy, a weighted movement to unlock our nervous system's ability to jump higher, jump farther, jump more explosively. Um, so our nervous system is structured in a way where um, if we utilize a, a loaded movement or a semi heavy movement, or even sometimes a, a ballistic dynamic movement, but typically it's used with a, um, a heavier movement. If we move something slower or move something with an intermediate pace, it recruits all of our, our, our muscle fibers. So each part of our unit, um, each part of our muscles, the fibers that actually make up our muscles are there. There's nerves that go in there and our brain sends an impulse to those nerves and it tells certain portions of those muscles to work. Well, when we utilize a loaded movement, it's our brain is sending that signal to the muscle saying, hey, we need to work now. We need to work with the entirety of the unit. So the the nerve, the the nerve that signals impulses without getting too into the weeds, it can it can stimulate and make part of the muscle or all of the muscle contract. And it's based off the intensity that we're trying to do. So what post activation potentiation does is it allows that nerve, it tells that nerve, hey, we need to use for this movement, we need to utilize the whole thing. We got to use the entire movement. So for instance, let's say we're doing a, um, a front squat. So we need to utilize the entire quad for this movement. We need to utilize the entire glute for this movement. Well, then we remove, we quickly turn around as soon as we finish our set, we quickly turn around and we do some kind of an explosive jump. And what, well, our nervous system is still telling our muscles, hey, we need to utilize that whole movement. So it unlocks the body's ability to jump higher or to run faster, jump farther. It unlocks the, our body's ability to perform those ballistic and explosive movements. Um, now, I wrote up here at the top uh, Alan Bishop's name. Alan Bishop is the uh, head uh, men's basketball coach at the University of Houston. He didn't invent this topic. But I think he's one that communicates this topic very, very well. And he posts a ton of content of different styles to uh, to allow for this contrast to occur. So upper body, lower body. He does a fantastic job. He's one that I think every single coach should follow, especially if you work in any way, shape or form with basketball. 
He does a great job. I think if you just watch, uh, if you step back and you don't know who Alan Bishop is, if you step back and watch the University of Houston men basketball team, obviously they have a great coach in place in Kellen Sampson, but um, over, overall, or Kelvin Sampson, but overall, I think they do a great job. And you can watch and see that they play hard. They play physical. Um, they're one of the most dominant basketball teams in college basketball. But if you look at it, they're not getting the top recruits. They're developing that talent really well. They're developing that culture. Um, and they're they're really, really good. Um, so I like him. I, I, I give him credit for this every time I do it because a lot of the concepts that we implement is stuff that he puts in um, and he posts a lot of. He's a fantastic guy. He's responded to several Twitter questions when I was first starting to get uh, first getting started in this method. Um, but again, we use this late preseason and in the end season. We'll occasionally throw it in in the off season uh, just to make sure that we're still hitting those explosive jumps and explosive movements. But we utilize it at that time because that's really when we're trying to get guys most explosive. We want uh, we don't want to we don't want to do it so often that our nervous system gets overstimulated by it and uh, it diminishes the return on it because if we utilize it every single day it's going to stop having that that the same amount of effect um, so we utilize it occasionally but our focus is in the late preseason and so talking late July into August through the season um, and again that purpose is we want to unlock that explosiveness through the recruitment of our nervous system um, and, and we make our muscles fire a lot faster and more efficiently but how we would do this, uh, we're specifically talking lower body here. You can use it for upper body stuff. Um, I've done it a little bit here and there, but mostly lower body. But for instance, we're going to uh, pair a loaded body, a loaded lower body exercise, such as like a front squat or a, a split squat, a lunge. Uh, we're going to that loaded lower body exercises with a loaded jump or with an overspeed jump. Um, what an overspeed jump is, is, if you take bands and you attach them to like a pull up bar, you rip your hands down and then you perform a vertical jump. Um, again, it's just a tactic of allowing your body to uh, learn force and how to absorb force. Um, uh, one of our game day uh, stations is a trap bar jump with that overspeed jump. So we take our, our hex bars out. We put about a 25 pound, anywhere from 25 to 35 pound weight on there. And then um, we're just telling guys to jump. We'll do three, four reps, depending on the day. We'll do three or four reps. Um, and they'll put it down. They'll immediately step up to the overspeed jump and they'll fin they'll uh, they'll do three overspeed jumps as well. And we'll typically do three or four sets of those. And that's just stimulating that nervous system. Get guys ready to say, hey, it's time to focus. It's time to be explosive. It's time to get ready to go play. So, yes, we do game day lift. Um, and that's one of the options that we do. Um, another example would be like a dumbbell jump with a broad jump. So we're going to take uh, some 10, 15, 20 pound dumbbells, depending on the guy. We're going to jump up on it. We might do a box jump with them. We're going to set them down and immediately we're going to work, go into a broad jump. Um, so that's another uh, another option as far as what it looks like. Again, you can do it with upper body for upper body explosiveness, but our focus here is lower body explosion um, and really focus on jumps, our get offs off the line for our big guys, um, our receivers getting off the line, all of those things. Any any athlete that we're trying to act to be explosive that we want to express explosiveness in on the field we're going to use a French contrast method with. So for us, that's everybody uh, because it's something that we need to train. Um, so that's kind of how we structure like our plyometric exercises. Um, and again, I'm, I'm without getting too far into the weeds on the science behind it. Um, that's kind of like the 5,000 foot view of, of what the, of what PAP and specifically French contrast is. Um, but where I want to spend most of the time today that we're talking about and kind of, if I had to pick one that was my specialty, I would say is the West side conjugate method. Um, I love West Side Conjugate because I believe it builds explosive athletes, explosive strength. Um, it stabilizes a lot of the joints. So that, that way we're reducing injury prevention or we're working on injury prevention and reducing those injury likelihoods. Um, I think it develops more than any other system as a whole. I think it develops intent um, with the bar. I'll explain that here in a second. And then obviously power production and what's called rate of force development, meaning how much force can I put into the ground in as little uh, as little time as possible, which is that's football. If you're looking at an offensive lineman who's going up against a defensive lineman on a, or vice versa, they need to be able to apply maximum force in as little time as possible. That's where you're going to get pushback and you're going to get drive off the ball from. Um, so I love the West Side Conjugate Method. We use it um, in the summer and into the season. Sometimes we'll pull back on it once we get to week six or seven in the in season. But I'm a firm believer that, especially for football, 
the in season portion of, of your training, that's the largest uninterrupted training block that you're going to have all year. We all deal with guys going on vacation, guys playing up multiple sports, things like that. The in season, that two to three week season from when or weeks from when camp starts to their first game, all of the 10 week season for us in Georgia, it's a 12 week season because we do have bye weeks and then any playoff. So you're looking at anywhere from 15 to 20 weeks uninterrupted of your calendar year being in season if you're lucky enough to play for a state championship. That's a long time, and that's a lot of opportunity for me to develop guys. Again, I'm lucky enough. Uh, I know we, we talked on Monday that I'm lucky enough to have my guys every single day. Um, in, the se in season, we dial it back to where we're training three days a week, and then game day lift on Friday is, is extremely shorter. Um, and then we have yoga one day a week. So we're training th uh, still three solid training sessions a week. Um, and we vary our volume for our starters and for our really our ones and twos on OD and special teams. Uh, but everybody else is training like it's off season because that's, again, 20 weeks of time where I I see them. We're most consistent in that time frame when it comes to attendance and things like that. Um, so how do we structure this? Again, we have four days a week of training primarily. In a West Side method, you, I've seen um, I've seen three days be successful with a West Side method as well. Um, but you really four days is optimal. Um, so Monday we come in and we have uh, a what's called a max a maximum effort or repetition effort upper body movement. For us, our upper body movement is a bench press or a variation of bench press. That could be a board press where you're taking two by fours and you might put one, two, or three two by fours on your chest. That's a variation of the bench press for us. Um, another variation, we might incline bench occasionally. Um, that's a variation as well. So we're going to utilize some variation of, an, of the bench press whenever we talk upper. Lower body is typically going to be that front squat um, or a deadlift movement. We will sometimes throw in trap bar deadlift and we'll occasionally throw in back squat as well. I know we talked about on Monday how uh, front squat is our primary movement. We will back squat occasionally as well. Um, but again, our, our meat and potatoes is that front squat. We're talking lower, we're talking those trap bar uh, deadlifts, we're talking uh, straight bar deadlift occasionally, um, and we're talking our uh, our front squat. Uh, we will clean in this, our, our clean and our Olympic lift, we'll talk about it here in just a second, more in depth, but our cleans are not included in this. Um, this is just those specific movements. But Mondays we come in, we do that same routine we were talking about uh, on, mon uh, on Monday when we talked in part one. Monday, we come in, we do that routine, we get, go through our Olympic work, and then we're going to hit some kind of max effort, or repetition effort, upper movement. So what that looks like is we might do a two rep max or three rep max on bench press every Monday, uh, but we're going to change the variation of, of, of what it looks like. So for us, that bench press might be um, this Monday, it might be just a flat bench, two rep or three rep max, no bands, no chains, no nothing. Next Monday, you come in, we might do a one, uh, a two by four. Uh, we call that a one board. We might put a two by four on our chest and we might do a one board, um, two rep max against red bands. And the purpose of our, anytime I refer to accommodating resistance as we're talking, um, I'm referring to adding bands or chains to the bar. Purpose of that is, is it allows for a lighter movement off our chest, which is typically where a lot of athletes or uh, in the bottom of a squat or at the bottom of the movement um, when those bands or chains aren't stretched out or aren't lifted off the floor, the weight is going to be its lightest. So for most athletes that's, and most of the population, that's going to be off our chest where we need it to be lighter and allows us to build up momentum as we hit into what's called our sticking point, which is where most exercises get stalled out when it comes to the velocity of the bar. So for most of us or most uh, most individuals in the population, their sticking point is one of two places, it's usually either for bench press off our chest or it's when our elbows are at 90 degrees. That's because it's we're transferring it mostly from our chest and shoulders to a tricep exercise to lock out that bench press. Um, so what this allows us to do, adding bands and chains, allows us to overload that top portion of the movement and really train that top motion or that top portion. So while the bench press might only be 185 on my chest against red bands at the top, it's going to be anywhere from 250 pounds to maybe 285, 290, depending on how long your arms are um, and how far you're stretching that band out. So it really depends on, on some of those. But the purpose of it is, is to give you the opportunity to build up momentum, get through your sticking point and overload the top. Again, um, just like French contrast, 
it helps to build that nervous system and uh, allow your nervous system to understand, hey, at the top, it lets me feel 290 pounds. My bench max might only be 255, but at the very top, that last two to three inches of the movement, I'm pressing over top of my maximal weight and I can still lock it out. Um, so uh, for our max effort upper movements, we want to be able to find and push that as far as close to our max as we can with that accommodating resistance. And when we talk about athletes, some kids handle this really, really well. Some kids really, really struggle with it, especially with the younger, the younger populations. Um, so we have to make accommodations. So instead of a red band, we we'll use an orange band, which is a lot less of um, it pulls a lot less on the bar or um, we'll just use chains. For some of them, we won't even add resistance at all because they still need to drill that movement a little bit. Um, but usually when they get through that one by 20 program that we talked about in part one, um, when they get through that portion of the program, they're usually pretty, pretty good. So they can typically handle just an orange band on the bar. That'll pull anywhere from 15 to 30 pounds at the top at most. So most kids can handle that fairly, fairly easily. Um, so they can, especially on, on exercises like bench press. So Monday, we're going to hit that maximal effort movement of our upper body. Um, occasionally, if guys are feeling worn down and tired out, we'll take the max effort out and we'll throw in repetition effort. So we're really looking for like a five by five or a four by six or a uh, six by four. Look anywhere from like 20 to 28 reps of a movement um, under moderate weight. So we talked about that force velocity curve uh, in part one as well. And we said we want to train all parts of it. Uh, that repetition effort method, um, when, when we do plug that in, that's that intermediate stage. It's not heavy and slow. It's not light and fast uh, and explosive. It's somewhere in between. So we'll plug that in occasionally as well. Um, on Tuesdays, we're going to hit our dynamic effort lower. So we're going to hit that explosive edge of that force velocity curve, again, to drive home explosiveness, to drive home intent, and to really teach our kids how to create power and create force into the ground. So we're going to front squat, we might back squat, we might box squat, um, and then we always do some form of trap bar deadlift in it. So Tuesdays, we really only hit, especially when we're integrating West Side, our West Side method stuff, we really only hit three primary, uh, three rotations. So we won our Olympic lift movement that we're going to do on Tuesday, two, our dynamic effort front squat or back squat or box squat, and then our third is that trap bar movement. I love the trap bar in, in the West Side conjugate system because it allows us to still uh, maintain that heavy position and think about pushing the floor away and really hinge, but doing it fast. So as soon as we break the floor where our, our focus is with with the weight, our focus is exploding up, getting our hips through and get that violent hip motion that this sport requires. Every position when we deal with contact. Every position has to be able to utilize their hips and every kid has to be able to understand how to integrate their hips in. So that's why we trap bar deadlift. We want to do it explosively and we want to do it under uh, max effort, um, max effort conditions as well. So we have to be able to get violent hip explosion through. That's why so many people love Olympic lifts. Yes, there's a force absorption profile to it as well um, when, it, when we talk about cleans, but it's violent explosion of the hips, which you need an O-line. D-line, running back, linebacker, anybody that makes a tackle, anybody that tries to make a tackle. So, I mean, I'm not a genius or anything, but I'm pretty sure that encompasses every position within football. So we want that violent explosive through the hips, which is what trap bar deadlift allows us to get within our uh, within Tuesdays. Wednesday, again, we do we typically do yoga. If, uh, if it's in the summer, we're off on Wednesdays. Um, we typically have like a, our seven on seven day during that time. And then on Thursdays, we do dynamic upper, upper. Again, this is bench press for us or a variation of the bench press. Um, and how dynamic effort um, upper works is we're really trying to drive home intent. So this is where we uh, we will utilize more bands and chains on Thursday than we do on Monday uh, because it's really difficult to move a bar slow with bands on it. When you attach bands and you try to move a bar slow, that bar is going to feel a lot heavier than it is if you try to go, uh, if you try to put power into it as well. So Thursday is our dynamic effort day. And then Fridays or our last training day is our max effort or repetition effort lower day. Same concept as what we talked about on Monday. The only difference is we've got more variability. So we have bands and chains that are variable to the bar to add. We can front squat, back squat, box squat. 
we can sumo deadlift, we can uh, traditional deadlift, we can trap bar deadlift, whatever exercise we pick for that session. And we'll rotate those exercises in. We can do one rep max, two rep max, three rep max. So there's a lot more variability to our max effort lower options than there was to our max effort upper options. Again, because of just those are the exercises that we chose. I love this because it allows kids to learn how to strain and struggle through hard things. Um, we talk all the time about building mental toughness um, and, and building discipline. I think this is the number one way to do it. We're not doing it by driving kids into the ground. We're doing it by forcing kids when their body tell and their mind tells them to quit. We do it by telling them to keep going. We also, number two, it allows our kids the opportunity to cheer each other on, provide energy for each other. Um, so that, that way, I, one of my pet peeves, and I hate watching it, is when I watch film and a big play happens on the field, whether it's a fumble, whether it's an interception, a touchdown, a long run, whatever it is, and then the sidelines just standing there. I can't tell you how many times I watch huddle highlights of kids and then like there's a massive explosive play and the guys on the sideline are just standing there like this. Like that bothers me. Um, if you're not excited for your teammates when your teammates succeed, you've got a problem. You've got issues, man. We've got bigger things to talk about. So Friday is a great opportunity for us to, to provide energy. We yell, we hoot and holler. We do a lot of crazy things. We're safe. We spot effectively, but our goal is to provide energy and get a crazy atmosphere going on in our weight room. Our coaches will jump in on this when we're in the summer and they're around. Um, it, it's, it's an awesome atmosphere on Friday. Now we will change this out a little bit for in season. We'll talk about in season I'm sure, at a later date or time or something like that. But um, this is primarily the structure of what we would look for um, in kind of our off season. Um, so that's the structure of it. But what it looks like, and we'll, I'll explain each of those those two to three methods real quick. Dynamic effort. Uh, again, we'll do this with or without accommodating resistance. That's the bands and chains. And how it works is you select a rep scheme. These are the four rep schemes that I like the most. Um, when we talk about dynamic effort, five by five, five by three, eight by two, and ten by two. Um, I love these rep schemes. Um, and then you're going to stick with that rep scheme for three weeks. And this is a uh, this right here. This is a them. So week one might be 45 percent of our one rep max. Let's say we're talking bench press. So we're talking dynamic effort bench. Um, let's say I selected five sets of three. Week one, we're going to do five sets of three with 45 percent of our one rep max. That'll be the weight on the bar. And then we're going to add a band or or chains depending on whichever one I decide. So right now, like yesterday, we just finished a, uh, a week three wave of our banded bench press. Um, so these percentages change a little bit based off whichever rep scheme that we select. Again, our focus here is not for them to fail. We want this to be explosive and violent. Again, we're preaching intent. We're preaching power output. This is for a control for uh, dynamic effort. I always tell them we want to control it to our chest, not slow to our chest, but we want to control to our chest. And as soon as we touch, I want you to think like you're punching your way out of a, of a paper bag. All right. Or if you've got the, the walls closing in on you, I want you to violently put leverage your back into the bench and I want you to push up with everything you got. Um, and then we're going to repeat it. So. This uh, this wave, these percentages of what I have here, this is based off like this is something I would use for five sets of three or eight sets of two. So week one, you've got 45 percent plus bands. Week two, you got 55 percent. Week three, you got 60 percent with five by five. I like week three to be 50 percent. That's what we just finished up uh, yesterday. I posted a video on my Twitter last night of it. Um, so if you guys have uh, questions or, or you're wondering kind of what the speed should look like, um, sh uh, semi shameless plug go check out the video that i posted on twitter last night um that's the kind of the pace the speed of the bar that i'm looking for on our five by five and that's as slow as i want the bar moving in our dynamic effort movements so week three would be 50 percent. week two might be 45 week one might be 40 um, depending on where we are in a competitive calendar so i play with these percentages i really when we get to when we get to dynamic movements i really don't like to go over 60 percent just because of the simple fact that, that bar is going to be moving pretty slow, um, depending on how much band or how much chain we're using. Um, so I like to keep that. So we'll go week one, week two, week three. After we hit week three, we're going to choose a different rep scheme. Or we might also go switch from, if we're talking lower body, we might switch from front squat. We might box squat. And then we're going to come back through the next week. We're going to week one, box squat, 
eight sets of two at 40% or 45% plus bands. Then week two, we're going to box squat plus that same band. We're just going to go up to 55% of our one rep max. And then week three is 60%. Then again, we reset. So it allows kids we're ne- the guarantee that we're never going to do the same thing for more than three weeks. So kids stay engaged. They mentally know that, all right, well, maybe I don't like this specific variation and we can just switch things up a little bit. So there, there's a little bit of that variability in it too, to allow for kids to stay engaged um, and push through it. So that's our dynamic effort. Again, our max effort movements is, is much, much more simple. Um, we will do it with and without accommodating resistance. Um, our, girl, our goal here is to drive overall stimulus. So we want to get as heavy as we can, plus the bands, plus the chains uh, in certain parameters. We'll use typically two or three rep maxes. I don't really like to do one rep max with bands and chains just because um, it's going to it's it's not going to apply as much to, to what we're looking for. It's not going to create the kind of power um, that we're, we're looking to get out of athletes. Now, if you're a power lifter or like some some states like Texas that have power lifting as a sport, Absolutely. Hit those one rep max because that's what they're going to be asked to do in competition. Um, We'll we'll hit some some one rep maxes against bands and chains in our max effort stuff um, as we get close to the state weightlifting meet and uh, which is coming up here for us in Georgia. It's coming up in in March. So we're going to be they're going to be asked to back squat. They're going to be asked to bench press one rep max. So we're going to hit those things just so that that's not the first time, just so that the state weight meet isn't the first time our kids are used to doing a one rep max. Um, So we have an idea of that. So we'll do that for those kids that are competing in that. But the rest of the kids are just training for football or just training for track or anything like that. Um, we'll do two to three rep maxes. Um, again, we'll use uh, for our lower body movements, we'll use sumo deadlift or trap bar deadlift. If we do those, we typically don't have bands or chains just because those are movements that kids, especially with sumo deadlift, movements that kids need to master. And it takes a long time for uh, for a lot of kids to master. Now, every once in a while, we'll have like a tactician when it comes to the weight room. Um, and they're they're really good technically. So then we'll add some. But again, those kids are, are few and far between. So, um, coach, any questions on any of this stuff is kind of like what our West Side setup looks like or what any of this stuff looks like before we before we kind of get into our Olympic lifting stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I do. I would like to see how you set up your weight room. Yeah, because, I mean, you got a lot going on um, mm-hmm. and you, you're so efficient in what you do. But sure, I mean, sure. Like, let me share this with you, coach. Um, so this is rack coach. Um, full disclosure, I don't get any kind of referral bonus. I don't get any kind of setup. Bonus. I don't do, I don't get anything uh, for what I'm about to say. But I think rack coach is quite possibly the most efficient way for me to manage my weight room um, simply because it's easy. It's color coded and it gives an audible timer for our kids uh, to to be able to hear and to be able to, uh, to to know when to switch. So for instance, this is what one of our timers looks like. So we run four-man rotations. You can set up in rack, you can set up two-man, three-man, four-man, and up to six-man rotations within each station. Um, so we typically operate off of a four-man station. So exercise one is our muscle snatch, which is a variation of our snatch that we use. Yesterday, they were doing five by five with no more than 100 pounds. Uh, we superset it with our band low row. Um, and then again, they're looking for eight re- or five sets of eight. Then we have weight change and rest. So what this does, um, we, I typically give them an op- optional exercise as well that they can add in here, something quick and light. This is typically where we hit our biceps or our triceps or those muscles that kids really want to hit. Um, but for when I hit play, there's, it gives that beep and it tells them that they should be setting up. Now, uh, I vary the amount of setup time based off what we got, but when it hits zero, you'll hear that, and that tells them to go. So and what, I is called, what is this program called? This is called Rack Coach. Rack, Rack Coach. Coach. If anybody emails me, again, my email is, uh, or DMs me, my email is dmullins at 616athletics.com. Uh, I've got it here at the end, too. Um, so I'll put up my contact information. If you guys reach out, I'll get you in touch with a guy. He'll give you a free trial so that you guys can try it out um again it's awesome it's what are we looking at per year pretty cheap um i'm not 100 percent sure um our school a thousand two thousand i I think it's about a thousand i think um but there's no no number of subscriptions so like our school i never used it before i got here our school pays for it for our entire pe department so the entire pe department uses it because there's again there's no like max number of logins 
every coach has their own page. So like football uses it. I know our baseball coach uses it. Our girls PE classes use it. And this is even, even the ones that aren't in the weight room, they use it for different activities so that they know where they should be. But essentially what this does coach is. Man, that, that is color. crazy. So you hook that up to a screen with the speaker. Like yes, sir. I don't, yes, sir. I pop it up on the screen and we Bluetooth speaker, we play our music and you can hear the buzzer and the beeps over the music. And wow. it's awesome. So I'll show you here, coach. It's going to, it's going to switch it through at the beginning of each day, uh, each kid at that station. So each of our four kids, cause again, we run a four man rotation. Each of them pick a color. So one picks yellow, one picks gray, one picks blue, one picks green and watch what at the end of this, uh, at the end of this timer, when this timer hits zero, it's going to buzz to tell them that they need to rotate and watch what happens with the color for them too. It's, it's crazy. Simple. It so moves you, them to where they're supposed to rotate to next. You they have, got five seconds. They got five seconds to get there. And then that beep starts and then they start working. And again, I can change if I want them more time to rotate or if I want more time to work or less time to work, less time to rotate. All of these things are up to me. So I set the times and then they just go. There's no thinking. There's no, all right, what exercise was next? It just rotates them through as they go. All right, then, so do you have video of your kids doing this? I do. Um, I don't have it on my computer right now. You got it on um, your phone? Can you just show it? I do. On your I'm phone? I'm trying to pull it up right now. So here's an example of what we did yesterday. But, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you show me more of the actual kids doing it? Absolutely. So I'll be um, I'll be posting back to it. I didn't get a ton of video on it um, last semester. Do you have anything I'm be on posting. Twitter? You have anything yeah, on yes, Twitter? sir. It's on my it's on my Twitter, and I'll be posting a lot more here as we uh, in the next couple well, weeks. Can you pull it up on your Twitter right there? Um, let me let me see if I have have one. We just got it back. Um, our school subscription lapsed for a little bit. Uh, we just got it back over break, so I'm just now integrating it back. Yeah, you you should be you should be working on selling that for them, dude, because that's so. <laughs> I dude, mean, who invented that? Who invented that? Um, I know it's a group out of Kansas City. Um, I work closely with uh, his name's Paul Sturette. He's a high school coach, and he does some um, some uh, JUCO coaching down there in uh, the Kansas City area. Um, he does I'm some great sold. work. Yeah, dude, it's it's wild, man. The fact that like, I don't get me wrong. At my previous school, we used um, we used Team Builder, which is a great app to get uh, to organize the weight room stuff as well. But man, there's nothing replaces this because now I don't have to worry about managing where kids should be or who's doing what. I uh, I can they they have their buzzers, they have their beeps, they know their color. I can just I can coach the movement. And I can coach the intent. I don't have to coach the effort of when to rotate and when not to rotate, how many reps you should be doing or anything like that. It's up on the screen. It's it's literally idiot proof. I, I really use it for my eighth grade and ninth grade kids the most when they first get in because those kids don't know how to train with intent and purpose and urgency. Yeah, ain't no so, talking, ain't no cutting up yeah. with that. I mean, it's like. No, there again, I'm in full control. So I dictate, I determine where they should be, what they should do, and how long they have to do it. Yeah, um, and it's very easy to spot kids that aren't following along with it because you oh, can yeah. see them not rotate. It's awesome. It's the best management tool I've used in the weight room. Um, and again, it's affordable. It's cheap. And again, I don't get any any referral bonus or anything like it from uh, for it. people signing up. So you know, I'm not plugging it because I make money off it. I don't have a promo code for you to sign up on or anything like that. I'm just a guy that uses it in our weight room and believes in it. So, <laughs> um, so that's one I would heavily suggest coaches looking at. Again, it's R A C K C O A C H. Uh, I think it's dot com, but they have their own Twitter profile and stuff like that too. Um, great group of people, and uh, they uh, I spoke. They're, they're they were partnered with the Glazier Clinic here in Atlanta last week, um, and I spoke Thursday night at their clinic. So, um, where did you got the opportunity to actually meet Paul? and uh, talk to him for a little bit. So it was awesome. And he was kind of sharing on some of the ways that uh, some of the technologies that they're coming down that are coming down the road and the way they're going to um, integrate some velocity based training and a dashboard to record maxes 
um, that's going to make it a lot easier for coaches. So they've got some awesome stuff coming down the road um, and some other things as well that they know that they need to work on and clean up. But from a man, I use it simply for a management for a management tool. Um, and there's it, it's worth every single penny for me. Yeah, coach. Um, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get them to come on here and talk about just that program, man. Absolutely. I'll shoot you um I'll shoot you his yeah. uh his Text contact his information number. and stuff. So I'll yeah. I'll send all that stuff to you. You got my cell number? Uh you message it to me, yes, sir. All right, yeah, just text me that because I got to get those guys on, man. I don't, I don't know if I even want to talk too much about this because I don't yeah. want anybody around me to get the idea. <laughs> yeah, man, that's legit. Yeah, that's, they're they're, they're great legit. guys. They're a great group of people, man. Too. Um, they're when do you want to come that... back on? When do you want to come back on and speak again, dude? Like you're so legit. <laughs> I can that's do it cool. here. Uh, I'm coming to the end of a term where I've got some term papers for my doctorate and stuff due, but. I've got time here in a couple of weeks wow. to talk too. So yeah, man, we'll, we'll get back on and we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk yeah, more in depth. Of just keep stuff. going. Keep going. <laughs> All right. So we'll talk for just a minute um, about our, our speed program, because I think this is something where we do a lot of things that a lot of, co I don't want to say a lot of coaches don't do, but we've integrated again, back to part one. I said that one, I think one of my strengths is being able to take in information, filter it, pull the good things out of what I know will fit our program and integrate those things as well. Um, so I know I throw out a lot of systems, a lot of methods, a lot of names of people that, uh, that have impacted, uh, made an impact on my career. Um, I, that doesn't mean I'm integrating their entire system from top to bottom. I'm picking out things that I think they do well and then, and that fit into what we do and can make our system better. Um, and speed is one of those where I've kind of taken multiple multiple influences and, and put them together and mesh them to fit our system. So the first and foremost principle that and method that we we operate off of is what's called Feed the Cats by Tony Holler. Um, if you haven't heard of Feed the Cats, you need to look it up and you need to dive into some of the readings on it. They're super simple readings. He's a track coach in uh, Illinois. He's Tony Holler is a fantastic person that puts all of this information out there. He's got a couple books that lay it out really, really well of why feed the cats, the purpose behind it um, and, and everywhere in between. So and, and the methods to integrate it. So what feed the cats is, is it, at its most fundamental level, we want our kids to full effort, max effort, sprint at 100 percent pace all the time. Anytime we ask them to move to, to run, we want them to sprint unless we're teaching them how to move. But if we're asking them to sprint, we want full effort. So what we believe is that if we want to get fast, we have to sprint fast at maximal effort. So how we do what we have to do is then allow them to fully recover. What I, one of the biggest, biggest mistakes that I see coaches do is they mix up speed and conditioning. Conditioning and, and my philosophy on this is that conditioning is built through playing the game and through practice. We practice fast. We practice with intentionality and we play the game. That's how conditioning is built. The off season and the 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 preseason, uh, uh, the early preseason is meant for speed training and getting faster. So we want we have to train for speed. And in order to train for speed, you have to allow for full recovery. If you're not allowing athletes to fully recover between reps, they they physically can't give you 100. percent So what this looks like is this var uh, varies in work rest ratios. So if we're doing a 20 yard sprint. All right. A 20 yard sprint is going to take anywhere from uh, from two seconds for a really fast guys to three seconds for our really slow guys. If you think about it, that equates anywhere to from a, a four five to a six second 40. That that covers pretty much everybody. So if we're sprinting in that time frame, we're going to sprint and then we're going to have about two to three minutes off. That's a short work, long rest ratio. But I can guarantee that in those 20 seconds, I'm getting full maximal effort. That might be pushing it on the rest times to the to the long end of the spectrum. We shorten it occasionally. Um, but for instance, if we're running 40s or we're running 50s, right, we're looking anywhere from um, our fastest guy runs a 4.5. There's a lot of guys that say they run a 4.5. This guy was laser timed at a 4.5 at a college camp. All right. and what does he run the hundred meters in? A guy that runs a four or five. He actually doesn't. He actually doesn't run track. So he, he's a he's a in football your experience. Only guy. In your experience, because I have so many kids mm -hmm. that tell me they run a four three, but none of them <laughs> hitting are hitting ten six in the yeah. hundred. Uh, we have a kid that ran a um, ten two hundred. Mm -hmm. 
That is smoking for yeah, high school kids. That is smoking. in almost every state. I mean, if, if the cheetah. Yes. So he's got offers from under ten in high school. He's a sophomore receiver. He's got offers from Clemson and South Carolina for track. Yeah, um, he's got a couple interests. Nobody's pulled the trigger on football yet because he's a sophomore. But he's got offers from Clemson and track and in South Carolina, both of the schools that have seen him run in person. Because he went to Clemson and ran indoor a ten two, which is it was like a ten two two. Oh yeah, smoking it uh, last summer at a camp. I think his 40 time, again, his start wasn't cleaned up at this point. His 40 time was a 4 5 5. Wow. A 10 2 guy. That's relatively slow. That's right. Yeah. That's pretty slow for four, for 40 yards. Yeah, for 10 2. We've cleaned up his start. We've cleaned up his uh, acceleration mechanics. We cleaned up how he gets out of the blocks, and he ran a 10 2. So he's going to a camp here in a couple of weeks, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he runs in a 40. Yeah, he's going to get, he's going to get off her. He's gonna, yeah, he's gonna be sub. I, I genuinely think he might be my first sub four or five guy um, on a laser timer. So yeah, um, he's he's got a really good shot. But man, yeah, the, the forty times are so inflated. There's a lot of technology um, technology that goes into play with it too. Um, the type of timer that you're using, the uh, if it's based off a a start when you cross the first laser, or if it's off your first movement. There's a lot to go into it. Um, but the the likelihood of a high school kid running a four three or a four four are very very slim um, in terms of what what they run at the combine. Yeah, I, I just um, want to say this because I've been preaching this for a long time, and someone told me this a long time ago. You don't peak out in speed until you're in your late twenties. The fastest people in the world are right under thirty years old. The strongest people in the world are right under forty years old. So, mm -hmm. like, these kids that are 14 and 15 and their dad's complaining, well, he runs a 4-6 coach. I mean, yeah. Well, guess crazy. what? Keep lifting. We're going to keep sprinting. And magically, if you're running a 4-8 at 14-15, by the time you graduate, you're probably pretty dang close to a 4-5, yeah. if not under a 4-5. Yeah. Just keep sprinting. Get stronger in your lower body. Put more force on the ground. Be able to repeat that and then teach proper mechanics um, and just drill speed. Drill speed. Do you um, agree with that statement? That the absolutely. fastest people in the world are, you know, they're at their late twenties, and the, mm -hmm. the strongest people in the world are in their late thirties. Those strong men, dudes, you know. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the, there's a lot of speed within within the football conversation specifically. There's a there's a lot of speed, especially now with really the the prevalence of really good training, both in the weight room and in, on the track. There's a lot of really good speed in that 18 to 22, 23 range. Um, but I would say, and this is anecdotally speaking, I would I would agree with that mid to late 20s is where you're gonna hit you're gonna hit your your fastest and your most explosive. Um, and then it kind of starts to tick off after that. But yes, yeah, strength, strength wise, man, I, I've seen it. As long as you can stay healthy, strength continues to build, 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 build. It's one of those characteristics that guys late in their 30s. Um, it are, are, are still peaking. So if you look yeah. at some of the record holders and, and there's a difference if we're talking powerlifting or Olympic lifting, Olympic lifting is yeah. typically younger because of the toll, a little bit of the toll that it takes on joints and things like that. Movement mechanics as you age. But the strongest people in the world are in their late thirties. Yep. If you look at, if you look at like, for instance, world strongest man competitions, or you look at uh, powerlifting record holders, they're typically in their thirties, mid thirties, late thirties, especially once you get into those, um, especially once you get into the like the world's strongest man competition. Now, I'm just a high school coach in Richmond, Virginia, dude, but I've been preaching that for probably 20 years. Yeah. Thank yep. you, brother. So, yeah, so we, we, we full sprint, we full recover because that's the, that's the method for faster athletes. Again, if we want to get guys faster, we, we have to allow them ample time to fully recover so that we can train them optimally. Then the most important piece to feed the cats is what's called rank record publish. So you want to, you need to collect some form of data, whether it's uh, if you're, if you're racing, collect wins. So for me, I don't have a timing system. I have catapults so that I can track some GPS metrics. I'm getting a timing system here in about two weeks um, in the mail. Um, if you're not timing, you need to find, you have to get a little creative with this, but rank record publish is simply collecting data you're recording data. You're going to rank it based off fastest to slowest, and you're going to publish it. So your top 10, you can even do this by position group. My top 10 uh, times on this drill. So the most common one right now is what's called the fly 10. So you get either 5, 10, or 20-yard lead in to a 10-yard time sprint. And then we're going to record that time. We're going to rank them 
for our O-line. We're going to rank them for our, sorry, our bigs, our mids, and our skills, and we're going to publish it out. That's the key part. A lot of coaches will record it. A lot of coaches will rank it, but not a lot of coaches will publish it. The publish aspect is what really drives home uh, the competition value and saying a kid can say, all right, here's where I'm at. I want to move up this leaderboard. So what are the things that I need to do? Um, so it, it drives home competition and kids get faster. Um, again, if you're not collecting data, you're just guessing. So we utilize GPS um, where we do some time sprints as well for our kids that are going to camp right now. I don't have a timer system yet. That's like I said, that's coming, but I'll record it look for their first movement and I'll time it to whatever we're, we're trying to do just on my phone. Um, but we utilize catapult GPS um, as our GPS tracker to track things like sprint distance, max velocity um, within sprints um, in different segments. We'll measure accelerations, how much time we're spent in each acceleration zone and things like that. Um, so we'll rank record publish based off our GPS data as well. Um, it just all depends on what you have. Um, GPS is one of those things that as technology is improving, the, the price point and the, the barrier to entry is dropping quickly. Um, you're seeing more and more high schools. When I first started this, the only people with GPS are those top notch power five programs. Um, but the, the cost of GPS is quickly dropping. Um, there's several companies out there that provide competition. There's Titan, there's Catapult, there's several different other options as well. These are all providing the same the same metrics, just different methods of collecting different terminology um, and different measurements of what you're trying to get. Um, guys, it, I, I, if you get one thing from me when I'm talking about speed, you need to find a way to collect data. If you, you, you can I can anecdotally if I'm your strength conditioning coach, I can anecdotally say, hey, we're uh, yeah, we're getting faster. I see it. And you just have to take me at my word. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. But if I can if I can look at data and determine my athletes uh, at the beginning of the semester, we're running this at the end of the semester, they're running this, whether that's mile per hour, whether that's a certain acceleration amount, whether that's a certain uh, time to sprint that I, I select as my marker. I need to be measuring something within my speed program in order to be able to show progress. And if there's no progress, data allows me to figure out why. So I can determine if I've got a 40 yard, a 40 yard dash with 10 yard split times. So I've got a 40 yard time. It might look OK. It might be let's say it's a four eight. But I know that in uh, I've got a time for the first 10 yards, second 10 yards, third 10 yards and then the fourth 10 yards. And I've got it broken up there. I can identify weak points in each of our kids. I can I can say, hey, this uh, Johnny really stinks at putting force in the ground in his first three steps. So we need to drill acceleration because his first 10 time really stinks. His last, his third 10 and fourth 10 are really good times. So his max velocity is fine. Let's just focus on acceleration. On the flip side of it, if I've got, uh, I'm going to use O-lineman for a, for a, an example. If I'm timing these same, the same 40 yard sprint with 10 yard splits, if they've got a pretty good 30, uh, like their, their third 10 yards, and then their fourth 10 yards actually drops off. Well, maybe I need a little bit of an uh, uh, aerobic work to be able to support their body's ability to maintain in that last 10. They got to their top speed well. They have a decent top speed. Their third block time tells me that. But then they drop in the fourth block. No kid that run, that plays football should drop in the 40 yard, the last 10 of the 40, unless they simply don't have the aerobic capacity to be able to sustain it. So these day, these times sp sprints and these segments of their sprint, I can look at that or uh, uh, any coach can look at that and determine, hey, what are the things that we need to do? Where's our where is each athlete weakest at in this point? And then we can select drills and exercises and focuses to fix that. Uh, but if I'm not timing, if I'm not collecting data, I'm just guessing I can cut. Like I said, I can come in there and say we got faster and you're going to have to trust me because I don't have any data to prove it. Um, so the number one thing that any coach can do is find some form of collecting data. You can get a time, a, a laser timing system, a two gate timing system for 700 bucks or 600 bucks. I'm sorry. And that's a dasher timing system. It's really good. It's a two gate system. You can get their four gate system for 1200 bucks. And that's what would allow you to do 10 yard splits for the entire 40. And that thing works as little as five yard sprints all the way up to hundred meters. 
Um, so you got you can use them for anywhere in between um, and you can time it. So it's a cheap, effective means of being able to collect data, increase competition within your program and give guys a leaderboard to chase and climb up through. And I can recognize, hey, this is what I need to do in order to perform. So if you take nothing else from anything I say, find a, a means, find a method of collecting data within your speed program and set up a, a system in place to be able to track it and use it within your program. That is, is the Dasher system? Get you faster. Yes, sir. D-A-S-H-R. Dasher. I got you. Um, they are a fantastic, like I said, they give a great, a great product. It syncs with any um, Android or iPhone and kid runs through gate number one, kid runs through into gate number two. It tells me how long it took them to get from gate one, gate two, right there on my phone. And it just pops up with a time done. Next, next, next. If we're, if we're to run in flying tens, uh, what I do is uh, I, I can run a flying 10 with 50 yard or 50 kids at a time. And we go boom, 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 boom. I can give them three reps and we're done in 10 minutes, maybe at the most. It's something super easy. Um, what I tell my kids, let's say we're using a 20 yard lead, um, which is our max velocity sprint time. I say, you see kid, uh, kid A in front of you gets through the second gate. You can go because that gives me 20 yards of acceleration for me to write down whatever their time was or screenshot whatever their time was. Um, it's awesome. It's a great system. It's super simple. It's easy to use. Any coach can use it. Um, but it allow again, it allows you to get times of certain sprints, record them, publish that data. Um, and now you have data to support your claims of if you're getting faster or not. It's an awesome program. Um, again, I encourage you guys, look, check out Feed the Cats, check out Tony Holler. Um, he does uh, and fantastic work on getting kids faster. Um, there's another two other two other people that impact our speed program. Number one is uh, or the next one is Tony Villani. He uh, he runs a, a combine training pro program out of um, I think it's West Palm Beach, Florida, um, but it's called XPE. Um, him and a couple other guys went together and made this. They trained Anquan Bolden. They trained um, uh, currently trained Ta Travis Kelsey, several big name NFL guys, all pro guys. Um, and they developed this system and it essentially it predicates it itself on on a couple fundamental um, ideas. And the purpose of game speed is changing direction and learning how to leverage your body to space. If you think about the game of football, if you're sprinting at full speed, like true top speed, full speed, not with max maximal effort. But if you're sprinting at maximal velocity, it's either really good because you're breaking a touchdown or it's really bad because your DBs or whoever are chasing somebody who's breaking it for a big play. So we really don't want our guys performing at max speed all the time. We want them max effort, but that's a different conversation. So Tony Villani's program, again, it's called Game Speed. Again, it's a free resource. I think he's put out uh, levels one through three or one through four out there for free on his website. Um, I, I finished courses, courses one through four. Um, there's, there's more in there as well that you can purchase, but, um, it essentially, it's a method in, of teaching kids, especially important for high school kids to be able to navigate their body and pushing against the ground in order to go in a desired direction. What I found when we first got here, our kids didn't know how to push against the, the floor and push against the ground in order to go in a certain direction. The ones that did or thought they did, they were a little bit better at it but they weren't applying force into the ground as much as they were as pulling their next leg. So I found that kids really do need to be taught how to leverage the interaction between the floor and their, their, and their foot. Um, and Tony does a fantastic job of setting up a, a structured program of how to teach that. And he lay, scaffolds it and lower, layers it for you um, very, very well. Um, and in not like super scientific terms as well. So I understood it really, really well. Um, but essentially, this isn't just for receivers and DBs, but O linemen need to understand this too, because they're they're planting, they're changing directions, they're cutting, they're doing all the same things just in a different set of parameters. So if you, especially if you struggle with like your receivers separating out of cuts and getting separation from DBs or DBs getting left behind, um, this is something that I would really suggest uh, to to coaches to check into. Um, again, it's just a simple, simple method of teaching. All right. How do I make a 45 degree cut? How do I physically, how should my body mechanically make a 90 degree cut, whether it's a roll 90 or whether it's a hard plant 90, um, there's a, there's a difference and your body needs to be able to respond to that. 
So what I would suggest, again, go to Tony's website, um, just Google his name, it'll pop up or XPE, Tony Villani and XPE. Um, they, they pop up there. Fa- it's a fantastic program. And again, it's a lot of free resources. Coach, now, I, took- I, want to, I want to just say, I am interrupt you. Anytime. The thing I love about your presentation is you're, you're in a doctorate program. So, you know, the value of research and, you know, using, what is it called? Peer reviewed articles and <laughs> people who are actually smart. Mm-hmm. You are not presenting really anything that you say, hey, this is my idea. You're basically giving us the guys that's got got the answers. And it, that's genius, dude. I mean, at I, the point of where we are in time within strength conditioning, unless you're at a program or you work in a research institute or you're at like a collegiate level program with multiple people, none of us are creating something new. If someone's telling you within strength conditioning that they're training kids in a new method or in a new manner, they're lying to you. They're taking information, they're filtering it. They might change the terminology, but the methods of how we train people, they're not new. The commies Um, have been doing this for a long time. Exactly. They all, all these guys have done it and I'm not going to try to sit here and try to take credit for it. I'm just going to say, Hey, they did this really well. I'm stealing that and I'll make it fit our program. So yeah, that's, th- that's my philosophy on, on how we do things and what we do. And, and like I said, I'm never going to take credit for something that somebody else does. I'm going to take credit for the ability to take all these multiple pieces and management, manage it within our system. But that's every coach. Every coach has to be able to filter what's going to fit, what's not um, because I'm not going to be able to take, for instance, um, let's say Mark Hoover. He's operating under that I mentioned in part one. He's he operates under a certain set of parameters and he's got a certain set of limitations in his program that I don't have. I have limitations that he doesn't have. So what he does, even though he comes up with some fantastic and excellent ways of training kids, what he does from top to bottom isn't going to fit my program. So I'm not going to sit here and try to fit a round peg in a square hole when I can just take it. I can shave off the edges of it and make that square peg round. So I'm not, I'm going to, I'm not going to try to fill, make what he works work here. I'm going to figure out how, what, what are the needs of my program and I'm going to take it and I'm going to utilize that here. So um, that's all I've done. And speaking of that, I took Tony's game speed uh, program and I took how he teaches that speed work and change of direction. And I implement into uh, Kyle Keese's grid system. So Kyle is uh, the strength conditioning coach and our strength conditioning coordinator and defensive coordinator at Denton Geyer high school in Texas. And he's uh, if you don't know that name, you should know that name. Um, Denton Geyer is a huge program. They're always competing for state championships year in and year out. Um, Kyle worked really closely or really well and uh, came up with what's called the grid um, and essentially it's a, it's a five by five set of cones or it's a set of five by five cones and boxes over the course of a 25 yard portion of your field that allows you to run multiple, um, multiple, a large scale speed session in a really small area. What this does, is it allows uh, coaches to view more reps and we can coach more reps and we can structure it well. Now, instead of me saying, hey, run up and I want you to plant your left foot, and make a 45 degree cut with your right foot, create separation and don't step outside. I can say, you're gonna run forward to the orange cone, you're gonna plant your foot to the right, your left foot to the right side of the orange cone, and then your right foot is gonna immediately step toward the blue cone. And I don't want any wasted movement. Kids are like, oh, orange, blue, all right, I got it. So, um, and, and it allows us to get 120 guys, 100 guys in a speed session in that small area of the field very, very simply um, and very quickly so that I can see all their reps. Um, it's, it's an excellent management system. Kyle's done multiple presentations on it. Um, he's a great resource to reach out to. Um, he's got drills and stuff that he runs through it. Um, they'll, they'll do it on, they'll do it on game day. Like they, I I know they've done it, I believe pregame, um, as a part of their pregame warmup for uh, a couple times this year too. And they were trying to test that out and see how it is. I'll follow up with them. uh, I need to follow up with them and act. Uh, ask how it went. But again, the purpose of it, we increase the number of eyes on each athlete and we teach that relationship between the foot and the surf, the playing surface. Um, it allows us to, to really just play the game. Um, so we utilize Tony's system with 90 degree cuts, 45 degree cuts um, and 135 cuts um, in the system of how Tony teaches change of direction. And we integrate it into Kyle's 
Kyle's management system, if you'd say. So that's our speed program. And, and really it's about assessing strengths and weaknesses. What do we need to get better on to fit the system that we're going to be putting in place next year? Um, whether we're a spread system, whether we're a pound, a power system, um, there's going to be, regardless of what your system is, there's going to be speed mechanics. Um, I say that offense sets the pace and sets how we play. So we could be a pound, pound the rock kind of team. Um, but our defense has to be more multiple because if all we focus on is we're going to beat you up up front, we're going to beat you up up front. Well, when it, we have to be able to meet the minimum demands of what the opposing offense is going to be able to put out there. So if they're going to come out in five wide, we need to be able to, and, and throw the ball around. We need to be able to adjust to that. And we need to be able to, to accommodate that. And our kids need to be physically prepared for that. So we have to do that. Even though we are a smash mouth team, run the ball down your throat, beat you in the O-line, D-line trenches, our DBs, our skill kids have to be able to stop a five wide team. So that's where our speed system comes in. That's where we build some of these competencies to get in and out of cuts, in and out of breaks using Tony's system, Kyle's system. Um, and we get guys faster with Tony's stuff. So or, uh, Tony Holler stuff. So um, that's about that's about all I got for you guys this morning. I know we were talking mostly speed and I wanted to finish up some of the weight room stuff. But speed is is where I really think uh, I really think the next big focus on is going to be on, especially when it comes to high school training. Um, we want to sprint with maximal effort. We want to teach kids how to push against the ground and go in a certain, a different direction. Um, and how can we do that more efficiently? Um, so what, uh, are there any, any questions or anything I can answer for you, coach? I mean, you, uh, you're just so legit and I, I really appreciated, I mean, you just given me the two things of the dasher and that program y'all use. I mean, I've already reached out to them and I'm going to get them to come on and speak. And man, I just look forward to hearing your next talk. I mean, what, what, what's the, what's the next thing that you want to do, man? Yeah. So I'm um, uh, right now I'm finishing up this term. Yeah. Um, you do, you do that, what you guys some, do coach. But like, some crazy I'm, stuff, but um, maybe next time we'll come on and we can talk. Uh, we can talk a little bit about more in speed and I'll, I'll show some videos of our guys doing speed and we'll talk yeah. that since that'll be, that'll be leading into to off season training or leading into summer where you, where a lot of coaches have a lot more time with guys. Yeah, no doubt. Coach, you're the best, man. I appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Like I said last time, anytime I get the opportunity to come on and, and talk about what we've done and if I can make uh, if I can make a sport coach's life easier by giving them tools and resources to, to run their system a little bit better and more efficiently, then then that's what I'm here for. So, um, again, my Twitter has a lot of a lot of the videos of what we do. Again, uh, that's uh, Coach D Mullins is just is my Twitter handle um, and it's M U L L I N S. And then um, my email is dmullins at 616athletics.com. Thank you, coach. Until we see, see you again, man, you're the best. Look forward <laughs> to having you back on. Thank you, brother. You got it anytime. Yes, sir.